we got we're a tiny bit ahead of the schedule so i'm not going to try to rush through you know i'll get through whatever if i don't get through this powerpoint today i'm completely fine and i'm not trying to rush it through um this is on this this next powerpoint is going to be the third part in the cardiovascular system. So we've taken cardiovascular and we've broken it up into blood, heart, and then the blood vessels. All right, so that's what we're on now is the blood vessels. So um, let me go into the PowerPoint. This, um, this is just kind of showing you, there's nothing I'm going to test you on here, but this is showing you systemic and pulmonary circulation, just that, you know, the blood comes out the aorta here and, um, just kind of ends up going to everywhere in the body. And then, you know, up here in the neck, it ends up going up the two carotid arteries, um, you're not going to have to memorize every single artery, um, but there's some you should know. For example, the carotid, that's like a very basic first artery you should know up in, it's up in your neck. Um, so it goes up to the carotids, up to your brain, back down the jugulars, back into the vena cava. That's all that's showing you, you know, out through the pulmonary artery back through the pulmonary veins that's pulmonary circulation i don't know why that's on here this is kind of a well that one should be first this is the you know the arteries going out and you can see the aorta here and it arches up and then it drops down behind the heart it splits at the iliac region named after the iliac you know your uh, hips and um comes femoral arteries like that Right, and a lot of these are named after bones, right? So, um, femoral after the femur, femur, tibial, popliteal, um, around your shoulder, subclavian. Then there's like a radial and a um, whatever the other bone is that I can't think right now. Actually, the radial's on this side, ulnar. Um, so a lot of these arteries are named after the bones, which I have a feeling you learned a lot of the bones so a lot of the arteries and veins take on similar names let me let that person in all right arteries going out systemic veins coming back you see it all verges into the Here's the inferior vena cava. Here's the superior vena cava. And, um, you know, jugular veins, subclavian veins. They all kind of have, most of the part, they have very similar names. Um, cubital is right here. And what else? Brachial artery is. Um, right here all right these are just some that you should know but let's talk about the so there's five different types of blood vessels we're going to talk about arteries arterioles capillaries veins venules and veins let me do that again arteries arterioles, capillaries, and then coming back to the heart, venules, which are little veins, and then veins. So there's five different, um, five different blood vessels. I look at it like, um, as far as like um, blood going out to, like as far as oxygen going out to feed all the cells, I, I view it like a road system. So you have an artery, there's not many arteries, but they're really big and they let lots of um, traffic. So that's like a freeway or an interstate, right? So that's like I-10, I-12, 
whatever, right? Those are those are arteries, and they have lots of lanes of traffic, and you can go really fast. And um, then you get off of there, and you usually get onto like a main street. You get onto like Reed or Paris or Clearview or wherever, and you know you're 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 obviously you're slowing down. And it's not like three lanes going in each direction. It's like two lanes or one lane even going in each direction. You're going a little bit slower. Then you turn onto a residential street. Those are like capillaries, right? So like something like Reed Boulevard, Paris Road, that's an arterial. And then a capillary is like the residential streets. Like sometimes you can only get one car down the residential street at a time. If someone's coming the other way, it's kind of so congested. You got to sometimes pull over behind a car and let them pass. That's that's how it is in the body, right? Only one blood cell sometimes can fit in a capillary. So the residential streets are like capillaries. There's tons of residential streets, right? Nobody has a house right on the interstate. Very few people have houses right on like Paris Road, but you do have a house on like in a capillary. So in this analogy, the houses are the cells. The, the capillaries are the residential streets. The cars represent the red blood cells. And the people inside represent like oxygen. All right. So when you want to go to a house, you pull your car up, you get out, and you walk across the lawn, you walk across the driveway, and you walk into the house. In this analogy, what do we call the um, driveway in the grass, like the lawn, the driveway, all that space around the house? The house is the cell. The street is the capillary. So what does that make the, the um, driveway in the grass? You could just think it to yourself. You don't have to unmute or anything. So that's interstitial fluid. So interstitial fluid is the fluid around the cells. So that's a word that's used a lot if you didn't get that word already. Um, you know, and then the oxygen's like the people, I guess, in that scenario, right? So you, when the red blood cell gets close to the cell, the oxygen just crosses through the interstitial fluid and goes into the cell. So, um, and I don't, that works for going to the house, I don't have an analogy, an analogy that works the other way, right? So I don't know. There's a different street that you would take, right? So you go in the front of your house, but deoxygenated blood, carbon dioxide, leaves out the back of the house, goes into the alleyway, and takes like the back street to the service road, and takes the service road all the way through the east. That's the only place I think, you know, and that's how it gets around. That would be venules and veins, right? So they never go on the same streets. Um, anyway, these are arteries, and they've got three layers. And so tunica, you know, comes from the word tunic, meaning um, tunic meaning like coat, right? So it's got like three coats to it. So here's an artery, and there's three coats so if you're looking here where i have the pointer there's the first three layers here this is the lining of an artery it's just epithelial tissue they're here they're calling it endothelium which is more accurate so this is part of the tunica interna the internal layer the internal coat right so it's endothelial tissue and an endothelial tissue aka epithelial tissue Epithelial tissue is always attached to a basement membrane. So that's the first coat. It's made from epithelial tissue, endothelial tissue, attached to a basement membrane, and then there's some elastic tissue outside of that. So those three layers make the first coat, the tunica interna. Then you have a tunica media, a middle coat. Um, that's these two. It's muscle and it's elastic. Then you have the external coat, the ex tunica externa, and that's just um, connective tissue. And that's what people say when they don't want to really explain it. They just say, oh, it's connective tissue. 
right? So um, I don't know what type of connective tissue it is. So that's the layers of the artery. So it's thick, it's got muscle in it, it's got elastic in it. If you notice here, take a look at the tunica media right here. Notice how the, it, the, the elastic's rather thin and the muscle is thick in comparison with this elastic. So there is some arteries that are like that. They have a lot of muscle, not so much elastic. And then there's some arteries that have the opposite, like this elastic layer would be really thick and this muscle layer would be really thin. So it could be the opposite. Um, actually, let me just go to that slide. It's right here. So when we look at that middle layer, there's elastic arteries and muscular arteries. So the elastic, so, so this one back here is a muscular artery. So look at muscular. Tunica media contains more muscle, less elastic. So let me just go back a few slides. That's a, this is a muscular artery. Or we can call it distributing arteries because it can redistribute blood in your body. Like if you are having a, if you're having um, low blood pressure, like if you're going into shock, your blood pressure is really low. Your body could take these um, arteries and constrict them. It's got, so the arteries in my arms and legs look like this. And I can constrict those muscles, constrict this artery and redistribute the blood towards my core. So I can keep it in my core and keep it out of the periphery. So in that case, my arms and my legs aren't really getting a good supply of oxygen or blood because I've constricted it. But in that case, I had to because my blood pressure is dropping. So you think about what's the most important part of your body, your heart, then your brain. Got to keep those going. So your body's making a sacrifice. Or if you get um, shot in the leg, you know, your, your arteries will will do that to prevent blood loss. But there's arteries that are close to your heart. So if we go back a little bit to, for example, the carotid artery, let's go right about here, right? I'm close to the heart or here, like I'm close to the heart. I don't want to constrict this. That artery is coming, it's, you know, it's coming right off the aorta. It's like a brand new artery, right? You don't want to constrict it there because now you're backing up the heart. You're messing up your left ventricle. Your left ventricle is pumping into the carotid arteries, into the subclavian. You don't want that to constrict. In fact, the opposite, you want it to bulge out. It's elastic. So, it, so when the blood surges into it from the, uh, from the ventricle, it's got to like open up a little bit. And then because it's elastic, it'll snap back. And that helps to push the blood further. So if you, so that's what these arteries are, like closer to the heart. The blood surges into them, they expand out, then they're gonna kind of snap back, do their elastic thing. That's gonna push the blood through the body. But down here, you know, in your legs, down further down in your legs, the amount of muscles more. So those are two types of um, arteries. Can't uh -huh. hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear me because I'm breaking out or because I'm like muffling the sound. I can hear you now, but you're completely silent. <laughs> I think I think on these Macs, I think the microphone is somewhere down and I keep shoving it into like my stomach when I'm talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is move to a table, which is what I should do from the very beginning.
there. All right. <clears throat> um, the veins versus the arteries. The veins, you know, they will go over, but they look a little different. They don't have, you know, they got the same three coats, but there's not as much stuff in them, right? There's no elastic, for example. So we'll get to why that is. And then if you look at it, um, this looks like a capillary, but my, uh, I've got something on here hiding what it is, but it looks like a capillary. Um, all it is is endothelial tissue and a basement membrane. So it's really simple, right? There's no, in the case of capillaries, there's no like tunica media or tunica externa. This is just a slide. Um, here's a capillary showing you how thin it is. Um, these little dark, these little dark circles here, those are the nuclei of cells. So those cells are like going around, right? And inside you see the blood. It's, this one's so small that only one blood cell at a time can fit through there, right? Whereas you, whereas if you look at this and let me see if I can make it, no, I cannot make it bigger. But if you look in here, there's like, you know, 60 or 70 red blood cells in this, like right in the middle there. It's kind of hard to see. They're kind of faint, but you see all like all those circles. So that's, those are like red blood cells. So that's kind of showing you the difference. Um, I don't know why I have this. This is just showing you again, elastic versus muscular arteries. All right. So we get a little bit smaller from an artery and we go to an arterial. So an arterial is kind of like a transition in between an artery and a, um, and a capillary. So if you think about like our road system, you don't go from a freeway right onto a residential street. That's really hard to go from like 80 miles an hour down to like 40 or 65 down to 25, which is what you should be going. Um, it's really hard to do that, right? So you gotta like slow down before you get to that capillary. Um, and that's what arterials do. And it's really, it's really about pressure. We're trying to lower the pressure. The pressure coming out of the heart cannot be the same pressure as in your capillaries. That's gonna blow your capillaries. So um, arterials are what, you know, they, they do that. So if you look here, you know, if you use like our interstate analogy, um, these would be like, you know, like Paris Road, arterials, met arterials, same thing, arterials, met arterials. And then these would be like all the residential streets coming off of it, right? And all the cells all these are like right in here. So what arterials can do is that they have like, if you look like right here where my pointer is, there's like sphincters. Like a sphincter is just like a, like a ring of muscle, right? And it opens, lets things through, and then it closes. Well, here there's what we call precapillary sphincters. So what your body can do, like in this case, the oxygenated blood is coming in and feeding all this area with, with oxygen. Here, they've come, they've, this person would be like in shock, for example, and they can, they can constrict all these sphincters. Make sure you're on mute. They can constrict all these sphincters and they can shut off blood supply to all the capillaries because something's wrong and you want to get it back to the heart. So as you look here, it's just going straight through. They call this like a thoroughfare channel. It goes straight through back into the venous system, back to the heart again. But you don't have time to like get off and like go to the cells, you gotta just get right back to the heart. Hold on, I'm gonna see who I'm gonna scold. Someone on their phone. Hey, one of you guys on your phone, um, mute yourself, please.
Yeah. Phone call person, please mute yourself. Hope you guys aren't like me when I'm in meetings. Is it you? Look at you admitting that. Listen, don't admit anything. Um, let me go back to class. Yeah, I do that like, like in meetings. Yeah, we're in a bunch of meetings. It's meetings every day. I just put it on my phone and then I put my phone down. Then I go do whatever I'm doing. And then sometimes the meeting ends. That's how I know that some of you are doing it because the meeting will end and everyone's off and you're still on. It's like, all right, <laughs> that's exactly what I do. You're not even, you're not anywhere near your phone. Probably the first time all week that you've not had your phone next to you. Good. Well, maybe if I can accomplish, accomplish that, if I can get you freed up from your phones, then I've accomplished something. All right. So capillary, these are like capillary beds. Um, you know, and, and and this is not like a major thing I'm going to ask you about on a test. It's not anything I'm going to ask you about on a test, really. I, it's just something that I wanted to show you that, you know, it's, it's the, the fact that your body can divert blood from your limbs and kind of keep it in the middle. So if you were like uh, hypothermia, you, you might do the same thing, right? You just you try to divert blood to your um, core to keep that um, warmer. These are capillaries. There are three types of capillaries that are shown here. And if you look here, it says continuous. And um, the second one is, I can't read anything, fenestrated. And this one over here is called sinusoid. So there's different types of capillaries. And, and if you notice, there are this one, this one here has like little holes in it. So you can see they're marked. They're called like fenestrations. Oh man, I can't do it without the glasses. Fenestrations. And then here there's like gaping holes, right? So let's look at the continuous first. The continuous don't let a lot of things in and out of the capillary. So that's all, that's what it's all about. That's the difference between these three. Are things moving in and out of the capillaries a lot or not much at all. So like in your brain, you really don't want to let a lot of things out of your blood and into your blood. And we have spinal fluid in your brain anyway. So you don't need to, you don't need the, the, the blood interacting with the brain a lot. You know, maybe just oxygen, but in carbon dioxide, but that's it, right? We don't want to deliver a lot of different things to the, um, to the brain. And so those are, those would be like continuous capillaries. But if you go to somewhere like, um, your kidneys, your kidneys are making, um, urine. And so you have some holes, right? The first of all, in between each cell, we call it a cleft. There it is. Intercellular cleft, right? So these little cracks. So like right here, my, my pointer, this is one cell. And then right here is another cell. So this little space right here is in between two cells. So that's an intercellular cleft, like a space in between the cells. Um, these are bigger on the, on the fenestrated capillaries. They're a little bit larger. So you can get some larger things in and out. And there's also these fenestrations, which mean like windows, right? So they, uh, they also let things in and out. If you think about a kidney, a kidney is, is making urine, so things are moving out of the capillaries, but things are also moving in. So, and then here, this would be like your liver, right? This hole here is so big that a blood cell can get in and out, right? So if you think about your liver, one of the things that you know about your liver is that your liver breaks down uh, old, worn out blood cells. So yeah, you need... You need big spaces because you need those cells to actually leave the capillary. So um, gaping fenestrations, like really big fenestrations and really big intercellular clefts. So you would have that 
things that would secrete um, your, your, your liver, your spleen, um, red bone marrow. Think about what the what does a red bone marrow make? Red blood cells. So how are you going to get those red blood cells into the blood? Right. So um, those are the three types of capillaries. I would have written a thing on it. I guess I didn't. All right. So three types of capillaries: continuous, fenestrated, sinusoid. Isn't that just it's just telling you how much stuff is moving in and out. Questions so far? Comfortable no matter what I do. Um, okay, this slide. Let me make it larger. This slide. This slide is um, talking about how things move into a capillary or out of a capillary. And right here in particular, we're talking about fluid. So how do we get fluid from the blood plasma out to the interstitial fluid? Or how do we get fluid from the interstitial area into the blood? So how do we get fluid into a capillary? How do we get fluid out of a capillary? Well, whenever you're, whenever something's moving out of a capillary, we call that filtration. So I have it on a different slide, right? I have it on this, so that's called filtration. Whenever you want something to go into a capillary, that's called reabsorption. So for example, if your hand swells up because you got stung by a bee, that's a lot of filtration happening. You have a lot of fluid moving out of your capillaries and into your interstitial fluid, and that's what made it swell up, right? You need that swelling to go down. You're going to need reabsorption to happen. So there's this slide here is telling you that there's two things causing filtration, and there's two things causing reabsorption. Um, I'm sort of calling BS on this reabsorption part. So let me just say there's two things causing filtration and there's one thing that I count causing reabsorption. So let's, let's look at filtration first. So again, we're talking about how water, how fluids leave capillaries. First one is blood hydrostatic pressure. That's just your heart beating. Right? Your, your, your arteries are pressurized. Your capillaries are pressurized. There's pressure behind it because your ventricles are contracting and constantly pushing blood through your body. That's making it pressure. That's causing pressure. So that's kind of pushing um, fluid out. So blood hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic, it j j just means blood pressure. It's just another way to say blood pressure. Maybe I should take out the word hydrostatic, right? It's blood pressure. The fact that your blood's pressurized. That's a push factor. That's pushing fluid out of your capillaries. But there's also something pulling your fluid out. And that's the second one. Interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. So osmosis is the diffusion of water. And so water follows solutes. And so um, an example, I said this before when we talked about um, al um, aldosterone, as I was saying that like you hold on to sodium, therefore water stays with the sodium. And if you pee out sodium, water is going to follow the sodium. That's how diuretics work. They make you pee out sodium and the water goes with it. Water goes wherever sodium goes. Right, and um, that, that's from biology, right? Hypertonic, hypotonic. Um, and anyway, water follows, in this case, it's not sodium, it's albumin. So albumin, if you remember, it's one of your, it's found somewhere that we talked about in your plasma. It's one of your plasma proteins. So if you look back at this picture, this is in your capillary. Forget about the color right now. 
but this is in your capillary. This blue is interstitial fluid. So you guys can hear me okay? I just wanna make sure. This is your interstitial fluid, and this is um, the capillary. So there's albumin inside and there's albumin outside. And just what happens is that when your capillaries want to get water out, they push out the albumin. So if I put all the albumin out here, the water is going to kind of get sucked out and follow it. And then later on, when it when you pass when you when you pass up the cells, we uh, the, your your body will put albumin right back into the capillary again, and the water follows that albumin back in. So it's like a pull factor, right? Wherever the albumin is, it's like sucking the water out of the capillary or into the capillary. So you've got these two words, interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, and that just says the albumin's out in the interstitial fluid. And this is the opposite, blood colloid osmotic pressure, the albumin's in the blood. And therefore the water wants to go into the blood where the albumin is. Wherever there's more albumin, water wants to follow it, just like sodium. Do you have any questions on that? Two pressures driving filtration, one pressure driving reabsorption. So reabsorption means it's going back into the um, blood. All right, these words are gonna pop back up when we talk about um, the urinary system, when you talk about renal, fun renal function, All right? If, you bought, if your kidneys reabsorb something, it means you're not gonna pee it out. You're gonna, you're gonna hold on to it and you're gonna keep it. So here, this slide is showing you blood, blood colloid osmotic pressure, and then they're adding in another pressure here called interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, which is nothing. It, it doesn't count for anything. I don't know why they put it in there. That's why I took it out. So you've got pressures causing water to leave a capillary, and you have pressures pulling water back into the capillary. <coughs> And this is up here, we'll talk about the lymphatic system in another chapter. Um, but in short, the filtration happens more than the reabsorption. So there's something called the lymphatic system that's going to drain the excess fluid that ends up in your interstitial fluid. But this is the slide. So I want you to know what filtration is, what is filtration, what is reabsorption, and what are the pressures driving filtration, and what is the pressure driving reabsorption. This is showing you pressure as the blood leaves the heart. So when you think about it, it's a systemic circulation. The blood's leaving the heart, it's going down to your feet, and it's coming back up to your heart again. It's making a return trip. So it gets down to your feet, turns around, makes a U-turn, comes back up your leg, and goes to your heart. The further and further it goes from the heart, the lower the pressure goes. And that's what this chart is kind of showing you. This blue line is kind of showing you like the average, right? This is like, what does this up and down mean? Well, they're showing you. Ventricles contracting, ventricles relaxing, ventricles contracting, ventricles relaxing. Right? Every time the ventricle contracts, we call it systolic blood pressure. And when the ventricle relaxes, diastolic blood pressure, systole, diastole. So here's like taking the average, right? So the average coming out, they're saying it's, I don't know, we're going to call it 100 because that's more like a like number. So pressure... I didn't write this down, but pressure is always measured in millimeters of mercury. That's how we measure pressure. Air pressure, like what's the pressure of oxygen in your lungs right now? That's measured in millimeters of mercury. MM, millimeter, and then the sign for mercury, HG. So it's like MMHG. So you'll see that after things, um, like here. Right? They're telling you the pressures. 26 millimeters of mercury. So that's what MMHG stands for. So 
that's how we measure pressure. So here, oh, I could have just showed you it right here on the side, which I didn't see. So it's 100. So here we are on the aorta. We're around 100. Then the arteries, it's around 100. And then you see right when it gets to an arterial, look at it, it takes a big dive. Right, so now you're going from a big blood vessel to a smaller blood vessel. It's like moving traffic from three lanes to one lane. You know what happens when they do construction on I-10 all the time, like every time, right? Everything slows down. And all that we did was we moved from three lanes to two lanes. Doesn't seem like it would be something that would cause us to slow down to like 20 miles an hour for a half hour but it did, just closing off one lane, right? Same thing in, our, in your body. When you make it smaller, the blood vessel, everything slows down. And the pressure, the pressure drops. So look how the pressure drops from an artery to an arterial. And then when you get down to a capillary, we're already down from like 100 to like 20. So it took a big plunge in pressure. And then look at it in veins. So by the time we're in, oh, that's manuals. Venules are like little veins, right? And so by the time we get to veins, we're down at like 10 or 15. So it's a big, big pressure difference. So um, that's why when you cut a vein, the blood kind of oozes, you know, it flows and it'll even drip, but it's not pressurized, you know? If you were to cut an artery, it would spurt. Right? Like I've seen arteries open. Like it'll, you know, me, I, I'm, I'm like two feet away from the computer. The blood would be hitting the computer, right? The blood would be like hitting the wall. It'll go three feet. Like it'll do it. Um, it spurts out kind of like in the movies um, because it's under pressure. It like, and if you, if you remember from like the movies, it like spurts and spurts and spurts. It's not continuous. It pulsates, right? Because that's every time your heart, your ventricles are contracting, that's forcing the blood out. Whereas veins, it's kind of flowing out. But your veins are, are more um, superficial, right? You can see the veins in your arm, but you can't see the arteries. They're they're deeper in there, more protected by your muscle and your bone. It's much harder to um, cut an artery. So, um, but my point is the pressure difference between an artery and a vein is, is big. And, and really that presents a problem. If you look at the pressure, okay, we're down at the feet. So here's the capillary. Capillary is feeding all of your little toe cells. And now the venule is when it makes that U-turn. So it's a capillary, feeds all the cells of your little toe. Now pinky toe is coming back up through the venules and then that's into the veins. And now I got to get that vein all the way up my leg against gravity and the pressure is like super low. And my ventricle is supposed to be doing this. So my ventricle has got to send the blood down to my pinky toe and I got to send that blood right back up. And what's doing it? My ventricle. It's a lot of work. And my left ventricle is busy. It's sending blood to the other leg. And it's got my hands. And it's got to send blood up to my brain against gravity. It's a busy little chamber. Right? So um, that's a problem. Like the pressure is low. So there's some ways that we can, that our body has to kind of help out, especially in the um, leg department, because the pressure goes down. Oh, well, I'm going to come back to this, and I'm going to come back to that. Okay. Uh, no, I'm going to stay on this. This is one way that your body can help get blood back up to your heart. So the problem was, how do we get blood back, you know, going, uh, how do we get blood to move against gravity in your legs? Well, one, it has veins. So the blood will go through the vein, and then if the blood tries to go back down towards your feet, it's going to shut this valve. 
So the veins in your legs have valves to prevent the backflow of blood. I took this from some other instructor. It's called Slideshare. Slideshare. I did your version of um, Course Hero. I took somebody else's stuff. Um, these next three slides are from somebody else, and I, I don't know who it was. Um, this is the second one. <clears throat> so this is in your calves. So in the calves of your legs, every time you take a step, your calves squeeze the veins that are in your legs. And what that does is that it, um, I don't know why these arrows are going that way. Oh, I get it. So you take a step, and if you're following my like arrow, take a step, blood gets pushed up here. Then when, you, when you're not stepping on the ground, when your leg is up, that blood tries to go back down, but it can't, it shuts the vein. Then you take your next step, your, your foot gets planted on the ground again, and your calf muscles squeeze this vein and push the blood up again. And then you're, you lift your foot to take your next step, and that valve up here closes. So every time you're stepping, the blood gets pushed up, 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 right? And each time you lift your leg, the blood tries to flow back, but it stops. Then it gets pushed up again. So we call that a skeletal muscle pump. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it only works if you're walking, obviously. Um, by the way, um, let me go back to these valves. Sometimes these valves can get all jacked up, right? They don't work for some reason. Maybe you get some something stuck behind it and the valve won't open all the way, or maybe they just don't. Maybe they're not blocked, but they just, you know, your valves suck. And so what happens is that before the valve, you're gonna, it's gonna start bulging, right? Because it's, it's, you know, it can't get through the valve, right? And so that will cause like a, a variceal, or like a, um, what do you call it? Varicose veins. So it's a little side thing. So skeletal muscle pump that helps bring blood up toward the heart, helps get blood going up against gravity in the legs. The other one's called the respiratory pump. So <clears throat> the right side, let's look at the right side first. This is between your, thor between your thorax and your abdomen. So if you feel the bottom of your breastbone, that's, that's where your diaphragm is, so it comes right across here. So everything above is called your thorax. You learned this last semester, everything above your thorax, everything below is your diaphragm. Right, and so you've got um, your diaphragm looks like this. It's a concave or convex, whatever that is. It's not flat. So that's its normal state of being. That's when it's relaxed. When your diaphragm contracts, it looks like this one on the left. It flattens out. I right? see they're they're showing you diaphragms relaxing, diaphragms contracting. So. When the diaphragm contracts, this in this reddish color, this area here is your abdomen, right? So it's here it is relaxed, here it is contracted. There's less room in your abdomen. So all your guts down in your abdomen are getting pushed on the vena cava, right? Because there's less room in there. So when all the guts get pushed on the vena cava, that makes more pressure on the vena cava and it pushes the blood. It helps to push the blood up, right? So Every time you go to breathe in, the first thing that happens before you breathe in is that your diaphragm contracts. So first your diaphragm contracts, then that's gonna cause your lungs to get bigger and that causes you to breathe in, All right? So this one on the left, this person's breathing in. And this picture on the right, this person has been, has breathed out. But what also happens is that every time you breathe in, it forces your, all your guts onto your inferior vena cava, and that helps to push the blood up toward the heart. Or we could have just read right here what this person put. Good press of dominant. Yeah. Or you could have just read that. I do that all the time. And try to over explain stuff. So, 
Respiratory pump makes sense. Skeletal muscle pump. These are all ways to get blood up toward your heart. I don't know why I have this on here. We'll come back to it. Oh, there's a few slides that we were supposed to talk about. This one, blood pressure. What is blood pressure? You know, it's like, this is like a typical number that people will say 120 over 80, right? 120, 120 what? Just to yourself, 120 what? Yes, millimeters of mercury. 120 millimeters of mercury over 80, right? That's what people give as like a standard um, blood pressure. That's systolic over diastolic. So your syst the 120 part is your systolic blood pressure is just what I wrote here. The pressure on the arterial wall, usually we take it in the brachial artery, although you can take it other places. You can take it here, you can take it in your leg. Um, it's common. Uh, if somebody's got like a shunt in one arm and they got a bunch of IVs or whatever in their other arm, then just take it down here. Or, I mean, you could even do it in their leg. Um, but the pressure on the wall of the artery when the, when the ventricles are contracting and then diastolic is when it's relaxing. So this bottom thing is called mean arterial pressure. And um, I don't use it, but I know in hospitals like nurses and stuff, they use it. Um, so it's, this is kind of how you get to it. It, it could be a, um, Mean arterial pressure is like a, they say it's like a better indicator for um, hypoperfusion, meaning not getting not getting oxygenated enough. And so um, what they'll do is they'll take systolic blood pressure and then they'll take two times the diastolic blood pressure divided by three. So if we were to do this using like 120 over 80, systolic is 120. So I'm gonna put 120 here. And then the bottom number is what? 80. So I'm going to take 2 times 80. 2 times 8. 16. So 160. 2 times 80, 160. So 120 plus 160. If I add those together, I would get um, 280. And then I divide 280 by 3. And so that would give me like 93. So my mean arterial pressure would be 93. Good. It's a nice, strong mean arterial pressure. Anyone have, anyone have any experience with that mean arterial pressure? Anyone have anything to add or any questions? Um, but it's just a lot of times, like, coming off the bypass, they, they rather a mean arterial pressure, you know, just because they try to fill the, the heart back up, you know, and all the blood vessel systems back up. And they just rather go with that single number like that. Um, you're supposed to have an equal sign right there. <laughs> I was looking at oh, um, it. I, I was just going to tell you, I, I saw you had that minus. And, and... There we go. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it is, I think it's more the doctors, you know, that's their big thing. It's not something as a nurse that's, you know, that you really see. I mean, to me, as long as you keep it up, at a certain, because I guess, because sometimes you have such a variance between systolic and diastolic mm. and this more of a true, true pressure. You know, it's, it's bad. It's averaged out basically. Because when you have something like shock, you'll have a uh, systolic and diastolic much closer to each other. Right. Right. That, that, that can mess things up. Yeah. So, you know, but that, you know, and they usually like it to be like at least over 60 when you're first trying to come off of, you know, the bypass and then, you know, eventually get it up a little higher if you can. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They want you to blow out the graphs, you know, so they don't want too high, they don't want too low. <laughs> went right, just in the middle, right? <laughs> the impossible sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So that's, um, that's what that is. I'd like you guys to know what what blood pressure means if you have it, if it's 120 over 80, what are those numbers measuring exactly? Then I think this is going to be my last slide. 
And good, I'm not through this, and I'm not trying to get through it. So this is, you know, this is a good place to end it. This is resistance to blood flow. And we've talked about this already. We talked about like blood moving from an artery to an arterial, how it slows it down, right? And just, I was saying like when you make three lanes into two lanes, how traffic's like slows way down, right? And that's, um, so when you take the lumen of, uh, you know, the space inside, when you take the lumen of an artery or, an, or a blood vessel and you shrink it down and make it skinnier, thinner, smaller, you know what I'm saying? So this is like an example. You've reduced the lumen by half, but resistance goes up 16 times. It's like exponential, right? The smaller you make it, it's not like if I make this half the size, it goes up um, times two. And if I make it half as small again, it goes up times two again. It's not like that. It goes up like times four, times 16, times like 64. It's, it, it makes a huge difference just going smaller and smaller as far as like slowing resistance means opposition to blood flow. So I'm really slowing down. And you might wonder, like it works with traffic, right? When we go to one from, from three lanes to two lanes, it, it slows everything. When you go from three lanes to one lane, we're stopped. Like, I don't get it. There's still cars driving through. Why are we stopped? Right, because it, it may, it's like exponential difference. And then the length of the vessels. And I was just giving you an example here of, you know, because we would say, well, I only have so many um, miles of blood vessels in my body, and it's not going to really change, right? I'm not going to get taller or smaller, or if I put on a few pounds, it's not going to really matter. What I'm telling you is like gaining one pound of adipose tissue, aka fat, gaining one pound of fat, or, or we could say muscle, you know, but gaining one pound of fat puts on about 250 miles of um blood vessel uh capillaries so i don't i was just kind of guessing here it's it's really more like um a kilogram puts on about um 400 miles of capillaries right so miles right so it's 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 uh that makes a difference that's that's resistance the more blood um vessels you have in your body the harder your heart has to work, the more you have to work to get that uh, around. And then the blood viscosity just means the blood thickness. Right? So these are three factors that um, that that um, can't think of the word affect uh, blood resistance, the opposition of blood flow. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. Does anyone have any questions? And stop recording.